Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Some of you who heard me last night had uh, said that you're going to listen again tonight. You will recognize a few passages, a few paragraphs. These two talks overlap a little bit, but their emphasis is different. But they're both about the natural law, really. But today I'm focusing more on a particular theme involved with the natural law, which is conscience, and in particular something that I call the revenge of conscience. You know, before I, I begin my talk, I need to warn you that I'm absent-minded in the extreme. I sometimes say things like, I have four points to make, and then I hold up three fingers. Okay? Uh, I have been known to to uh, stop at stop signs and wait for them to turn green. <laughs> I sometimes say, and yes, I, I'm really embarrassed about this, I sometimes say pro when I mean anti, and anti when I mean pro, and that causes terrible confusion. It's a, it's a real sin for a speaker. I used to call my daughters by the names of the cats. <laughs> One of my, um, I was, when I mentioned that to one of my colleagues, he said uh, reassuringly, that's nothing, I used to do the same thing. And I answered, well, these were the dead cats. <laughs> he said, you win. <laughs> Why am I beginning with such feeble efforts at humor? Well, partly because they aren't entirely humorous. Everything that I've just told you is really true. But there is another more serious reason for being less than serious. They say that speakers should introduce their, you know, you've heard this kind of advice before, should introduce their topic with a quip or two, with a little joke. But my topic tonight, the revenge of conscience, doesn't lend itself to hilarity. I don't know whether you've noticed, but there aren't very many side-splitting jokes about conscience, much less revenge. Uh, I know, because uh, I've looked. Just by looking, though, you know, I did spend a little time in search before I wrote this talk, I've learned something else. Humorists are uncomfortable with conscience. The few mildly amusing, is there still a little feedback, by the way? Or do you hear it? Okay, I heard it up here. I thought maybe you were getting feedback. The, uh, the few mildly amusing things that humorists do say about it make, the, make this discomfort of theirs pretty clear. Exhibit A is Mark Twain, who has his masterpiece, Huck Finn Say, it don't make no difference whether you do right or wrong. A person's conscience ain't got no sense and just goes for him anyway. If I had a yeller dog that didn't know no more than a person's conscience does, I would poison him. Well, Twain, who's pretty cynical, seems to agree with Huck. He writes in another book about how he would make man if he could set God's work aside and do it all over again. If I had the remaking of man, says Twain, he wouldn't have any conscience. It's one of the most disagreeable things connected with a person. And although it certainly does a great deal of good, it cannot be said to pay. Well, I wonder whether Twain would have joked about it if he'd lived a little longer, the last century of history. The last hundred years or so has featured any number of tyrants who have tried to remake man like that, who have tried to make re remake man without the yeller dog of conscience. A German politician and writer who was named Hermann Rauschen, Rauschning wrote that Adolf Hitler, whom he'd once interviewed, had boasted to him, I liberate man from the filthy and degrading torments inflicted on him by a chimera called conscience and morality. Well, in the meantime, quite a number of our social scientists and philosophers uh, seem to agree that that would be a liberation. They say in one way or another that conscience is arbitrary and ultimately meaningless. We hear from one squad of such thinkers that conscience is merely a set of inhibitions pumped into you by how you were raised, and if you'd been raised differently, you'd have had a different conscience. Uh, as it is, they say, you believe in playing fair, but you might just as well have turned out believing in playing dirty. We hear from another squad that conscience is merely a set of in in inhibitions and compulsions that might have had adaptive value uh, for our remote primate ancestors. But uh, if our evolutionary history had been different, we might have had a different conscience. As it is, they say, we care for our young, 
but we might just as well have turned out like guppies who eat them. Well, what then is conscience? To answer this question, I think we have to start farther back. We have to start farther back with the foundations of morality. Will you allow me to do so? I'm asking you for a reason. You know, you might not allow me. These days, it's considered rude. Have you noticed to suggest that there's a real right and wrong? People get very wroth at you. Yet there are some uh, moral truths that we all really know, aren't there? We can't not know that life is something good. We can't not know that we ought to have gratitude for the generosity of others. Deep down, even the murderer knows the wrong of murder. Even the thief knows the wrong of theft. Even the adulterer knows the wrong of adultery. The moral truths that I'm speaking about are a universal possession. They're an emblem of the rational mind. They are an heirloom of the family of man. These moral basics, together with their first few rings of implications, have traditionally been called the natural law. Law because they're binding. Natural because we didn't make them up. They're built into the design of human nature. They're woven into the fabric of the adult, the normal adult human mind. Because they are law, and because we didn't make them up, they also stand in judgment on all man-made law. As St. Augustine wrote many centuries ago, an unjust law would better be described as an act of violence, something that isn't really a law at all, but pretending to be a kind of enacted fraud. Now, because people are sometimes troubled by such claims, let me make everything very clear. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding about what I'm claiming. I don't say that we know these moral basics with unfailing, perfect clarity, or that we've reasoned out their remotest implications. We don't, and we haven't. Nor do I say that we never pretend not to know them. We do. Nor do I say that we never lose our nerve when somebody tells us that they aren't true. We do that too. I don't even suggest that we're born knowing them, if that's what's meant by knowledge being innate. The claim of natural law is not really that there is innate moral knowledge. I don't claim that we never get mixed up about them or that we agree to them just as readily whether they're taught to us or not. You know, those things can't even be said about the knowledge of the principle that two plus two equals four. Yet, such as it is, our moral knowledge is as real as arithmetic and probably just as plain. Paradoxically, maddeningly, we appeal to it even in order to justify our wrongdoing. The murderer doesn't normally declare how right it is to deliberately take innocent human life, does he? What he says is, it wasn't deliberate. See, I didn't have a choice. Uh, he wasn't innocent. See, he took the job that should have gone to me. Rationalization is the, the homage paid by guilt to moral knowledge. Now, I've said that the knowledge of the moral basics is universal, and it's really too bad that it's not the only thing that's universal. There's something else that's universal, too, and that's a desire to evade our moral knowledge, to evade the moral basics. It's been said that a law is written on the heart of man. Well, one is, but it, that law is everywhere entangled with the evasions and subterfuges of men. And even so, that law endures. And even so, it's seen to endure. The real surprise isn't how little of the natural law comes across in cross-cultural surveys, but how much of the natural moral law comes across in cross-cultural surveys. Surveying the landscape. Here's what one anthropologist named Clyde Clickon said about this. I'm quoting him. Every culture, he said, has a concept of murder and distinguishes this from execution, killing, and war, and other justifiable homicides. The notions of incest and other regulations upon sexual behavior, of prohibitions upon untruth under defined circumstances, of restitution and reciprocity, of mutual obligations between parents and children, these and many other moral concepts are altogether universal, he said. Now, Klukong's reminder, he was an anthropologist, but you know, other anthropologists have sometimes said different things, haven't they? This reminder was lost among some of these other travelers' tales about, for instance, Samoan 
free love paradises that didn't recognize sexual morality, or about the supposed Ik, a tribe of Eastern Africa who, who supposedly didn't recognize any duties toward other people and were said by the first person who studied them to be devoid of any such thing as conscience. But Margaret Mead turned out to be wrong about the Samoans, <coughs> dead wrong. And Colin Turnbull turned out to be dead wrong about the Ick. The Samoans turned out, these people that were supposed to have this free love paradise, turned out to be fierce defenders of chastity. How funny that she studied them all, all at that time and didn't notice. Uh, the Ick turned out to have a strong sense of mutual obligation. Uh, like other people then, anthropologists might sometimes see only what they want to see and not notice the things they don't want to see, but the record does eventually correct itself. Now, I hope nobody thinks that I'm picking on anthropologists. They aren't the only ones who sometimes miss what's right underneath their eyes. For, for example, consider the views of Judge Richard Posner, who once said in a lecture, morality is local. There are no interesting moral universals. There are, he said, tautological ones, such as murder is wrong, where murder means wrongful killing. And there are a few rudimentary principles of social cooperation, such as don't lie all the time, or don't break promises without any reason, or don't kill your relatives or neighbors indiscriminately that may be common to all human societies. If one wants to call these rudimentary principles the universal moral law, fine. But as a practical matter, these norms are too abstract to serve as standards for moral judgment. Therefore, moral relativism is in. Now, unfortunately, Judge Posner produces this conclusion of his by smoke and mirrors. Take that example of his. He says, well, sure, you might have a universal principle, murder is wrong, but it's entirely circular because people mean by murder just the kind of killing that's wrong. And they don't all agree about what that is. Well, that's not true. Only the most superficial consideration could support his conclusion that nothing more is meant by murder than wrongful killing. Now, it's true, not all killing is murder. But what makes killing wrong, the understanding of what of what makes killing wrong is far from totally variable. The deliberate taking of innocent human life is always and everywhere understood to be wrong. And some other things are always understood to be murderous too. For example, we understand that it's wrong for even guilty human life to be taken for light cause, without a fair trial, or by someone who lacks public authority to carry out the penalty. Now, someone may say that I'm wrong, that the wrong of deliberately taking innocent human life is not always and everywhere understood to be wrong. What about the Holocaust, for example? Surely the Nazi death camp car guards had no scruples about killing innocents. They seemed to think it was fine to deliberately take innocent human life. And I, I am often challenged that way. And uh, I certainly agree. Yeah, they did kill innocents, didn't they? Millions of them. Surprisingly, though, when we study them, what we find is that for all the cruelty of these uh, death camp administrators and guards, the Nazis who maintained this system, for all their cruelty, not even they could expunge from their own consciences the knowledge of the wrong of deliberately taking innocent human life. They couldn't do it. They tried but they couldn't do it. In the first place, in order to carry out the killings, they had to convince themselves somehow, or try to convince themselves, that the wholesale extermination of the Jews wasn't deliberately taking innocent human life. The Nazi propaganda theme of the, the Untermensch, as it was called, the Underman, played into this effort by contending that the Jews were either less than innocent, or less than human, or both, so that taking their life wasn't deliberately taking innocent human life. One SS pamphlet contended, I gave this quote last night, if you were there too, from a biological point of view, quote unquote, he seems completely normal. He has hands and feet and a sort of brain, but in fact he's a completely different creature, a horror. He only looks human with a human face, but his spirit is lower than that of an animal. A terrible chaos runs rampant in this creature, an awful urge for destruction primitive desires, unparalleled evil, a monster, subhuman. 
That's what they had to tell themselves about the Jews in order to try to convince themselves that they weren't really deliberately taking innocent human life. It was a lie, of course, but they had to try to convince themselves of it. Nazis <coughs> dehumanized Jews in other ways, too, to try to make it seem that they weren't deliberately taking innocent human life. For example, by herding them naked from the train disembarkation platform to the barracks, to the barracks so that they would seem like mere cattle to the prison guards. Now, why bother doing that? Gitta Sereny, a journalist, asked Franz Stangl, the former commandant of the Treblinka death camp. She interviewed him after he was put in prison after the war. If they were going to kill them anyway, she asked him, what was the point of all the humiliation? Why all the cruelty? And he replied, to condition those who actually had to carry out the policies to make it possible for them to do what they did. In the second place, all those Nazi efforts to convince themselves that slaughtering Jews wasn't the deliberate taking of innocent human life failed terribly. Guilty knowledge was an overwhelming burden for the exterminators. Robert J. Lifton, who was a psychologist who wrote a book about this afterward called The Nazi Doctors, he was especially interested in how medical doctors could have perverted their, uh, their profession, their vocation, in the way that they did in the death camps. He reports in an interview with a former Wehrmacht neuropsychiatrist who had treated large numbers of death camp soldiers. For what? For psychological disorders. And the, uh, the neuropsychologist told Lifton that their symptoms were a lot like those of combat troops, but worse. They were more severe, and they lasted longer. The guards had the hardest time shooting women and children, uh, especially children, and a lot of them had nightmares of punishment or of retribution. Allow me to point out the obvious. People with untroubled consciences do not have dreams of being accused by their victims. <coughs> but isn't it hard to know what's right and wrong? As to the details, sometimes, yes, there are such hard, there are such things as hard moral questions, difficult moral questions. But as to the big picture, I think the answer is no. We like to believe that moral truth is very difficult to find, but that we're honestly searching for it. Don't we like to tell ourselves that? We like to tell ourselves, well, we're trying to see on a foggy night. We're doing the best that we can, but everything is shades of gray. Well, if that is true, if that were true, then when we do wrong, it wasn't really sin. It was only a mistake. We didn't know any better. But that's not really true, is it? Oftentimes, we do know better. Oftentimes, it was more than a mistake. We may merely tell ourselves that we don't know better. I think this is just what we do. There's a difference between honest ignorance and self-deception, a difference between not knowing and being in denial about our knowledge. Libertines, like us, aren't ignorant of the basics of right and wrong, although we may pretend to ourselves that we are. We like to think that we are. The deep structure of the moral intellect, which all human beings share, simply doesn't permit total ignorance. Ignorance isn't the explanation of the moral chaos of our times, and our times really are morally chaotic. The moral chaos of our times has a different explanation. The problem isn't that we're ignorant, but that we're in denial. We're passing through an eerie stage of history in which we treat as offensive and unheard of the things that everyone really knows. Nothing quite like this has ever happened before. True enough, our civilization has passed through troughs of immorality before. That happens periodically. Uh, civilizations go through moral high points, moral low points. But in each of those cases, vice pretty much admitted what it was. Our case is different. Today, vice doesn't admit what it is. It plays dumb. This is a ruinous affair, but it can't last because I think holding down deep moral knowledge is uh, more than a little bit like pushing down on a wildcat. Your, uh, your team mascot here is the cougar, right? Mm -hmm. Well, imagine trying to push down on a cougar and make him go to sleep. 
He doesn't want to lie down, but you're trying to push him down. That's what it's like sometimes when we try to repress our moral knowledge. It is like uh, pushing down on a wildcat and expecting it to go to sleep. It claws. In the same way, guilty knowledge claws and conscience has its revenge. Well, you might have been waiting for that point or when wondering when the other shoe would drop. At last, I've come back to conscience. Discussions of conscience suffer from two great confusions today. One confusion, I've alluded to them before, is to think, one confusion is to think that my conscience is purely subjective, so that if conscience really does have some dignity, that means that I can do whatever I want. Hey, it's my conscience, buddy. It's just different than your conscience. Well, not so. Conscience is a witness to truth that doesn't depend on what I want. The second confusion is the idea that conscience is merely a residue of socialization. You know, something pumped in from the outside. You know the drill, don't you? Your parents told you things. Your teachers told you things. The policeman told you things. The minister told you things. And somehow all those things got inside you and made a conscience. Now, let's be honest. That story isn't entirely false, but it's way overstated. It isn't all true either. Certainly there is something in conscience that's influenced by teaching from outside. The ancients had a name for that. They called it conscientia. Let's call it surface conscience. But there's also an element in conscience that doesn't come in from outside. The ancients called it syndaresis. Let's call it deep conscience. In fact, if it weren't for deep conscience, what people try to tell you about right and wrong couldn't take any root in you at all. When, uh, when your parents, you told you when you were small, play fair. You know, don't take uh, more than your share of the cake. Your sister deserves some too. Don't pull the cat's tail. How would you like it if your tail was pulled? Why would that make any impact on us unless we already knew something, unless it did make sense to us? Uh, we have some deep, with some, some deep moral awareness that doesn't depend on teaching and that allows that teaching to take root. Deep conscience is far more important than surface conscience. It can't be erased. It can't be mistaken. And unlike surface conscience, it's the same in every human being. The only way to tamper with it is self-deception. Telling myself that I don't know what I really do. All natural law thinkers agree that it includes the things like the, inviolable, the knowledge of inviolable goods, like friendship, the uh, knowledge of formal norms, like fairness, the knowledge of everyday moral rules, like thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not deliberately take innocent human life. Deep conscience is the reason why even a man who tells himself, himself uh, because of his his indoctrination or his, his idea, his relativist ideology, there is no right and wrong, or it's different for everyone, or it's different for every culture, uh, may shrink from committing murder. Why even a man who does murder may suffer the pangs of remorse. And why even a man who has deadened himself to remorse shows other symptoms of deeply buried guilty knowledge. By other symptoms of guilt, deeply buried guilty knowledge, I don't mean guilty feelings. I don't mean guilty feelings because no one always feels guilty for committing known wrong. That's disturbing, but it's true. And some people never do. We sometimes imagine that if you don't have guilty feelings, then you don't have a conscience. This isn't true. Deep conscience is knowledge, not feelings. And guilty knowledge darkly asserts itself, regardless of the state of your feelings. I'll give you an example. I read an article uh, in which the, the pro-abortion journalist who was writing the article quoted a pro-abortion psychological counselor whom she interviewed. And the uh, counselor said, quote, I am not confident even now with abortion so widely used that women feel it's okay to want an abortion without feeling guilty. They say, am I some sort of monster that I feel all right about this? Now you see, this, the counselor was disturbed. She said she, what she thought was that it wasn't wrong to have an abortion and that women should feel all right about it, but, the, but so many of the women that she counseled who had had abortions 
said, well, yes, I, do, I don't feel guilty for having an abortion, but I feel like I'm a monster because I don't feel guilty. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that statement revealing? Plainly, if a woman has guilty feelings for not having guilty feelings, she must have guilty knowledge. Now, how does guilty knowledge work? Most people answer, well, through remorse, through guilty feelings. There, we're back to that mistake again. That's not a very good answer because there are five, I'll call them the Furies. You know what the Furies were in Greek mythology? They were these uh, beings who pursued the guilty person, took revenge. Uh, let's use that as a metaphor. There are five Furies, and remorse is the least of them. No one always feels bad for doing wrong. Some people never feel bad for doing wrong. They're called sociopaths. Yet even when remorse is absent, guilty knowledge generates objective needs. These are the other four theories. Objective needs for confession, for atonement, for reconciliation, for justification. These other four theories I, I call the greater sisters of remorse. Inflexible, inexorable, and relentless demanding satisfaction even when mere feelings are suppressed or fade away or never come. How this works isn't so difficult to grasp. You know, the normal outlet of remorse, let's talk about that weakest of the five theories first, the normal outlet of remorse is to flee from wrong. The normal outlet of the need for confession is to admit what you've done. The normal outlet of atonement is to pay the debt. The normal outlet of the need for reconciliation is to restore the bonds that you've broken by wrongdoing. The normal outlet of justification is to get back into justice, to get back into right. But if the theories, if we won't do that because we refuse to repent, if we won't do that because we're obstinate in our wrongdoing, if the theories are denied their payment in the proper coin, they exact payment in whatever counterfeit coin comes closest. And they drive the wrongdoer's life yet further out of kilter. As to remorse, instead of fleeing from wrong, we flee from thinking about it. I won't think about that today. Be quiet. As to confession, we compulsively tell every detail, every sordid detail of our deeds sometimes, except the moral, except that what we did was wrong. As to atonement, we may punish ourselves again and again, paying pain after pain, price after price, offering every sacrifice there is, breaking our relationships, doing this, doing that, getting ourselves addicted, paying every sacrifice except the sacrifice of a repentant heart, which is the one sacrifice demanded. As to reconciliation, we may not repair the bonds that we've broken, but we simulate the restoration of broken intimacy by seeking companions that we can feel close to who are as guilty as ourselves, even to the point of recruiting them to our own wrongdoing. As to justification, we seek not to become just, but to justify ourselves. That's what I mean by the revenge of conscience. The revenge of conscience is the focus of my own research into the natural law. Uh, I'm particularly interested in false atonement. Some examples of false atonement, paying a price but the wrong price, not the one price demanded of a broken and contrite spirit, but uh, paying prices that are not really demanded and that don't pay off the debt. Some examples of false atonement are obvious, some aren't so obvious. One obvious place to look is criminality. Dostoevsky, the great Russian novelist, uh, wrote once in a letter to one of his publishers that legal punishment inflicted for a crime intimidates a criminal infinitely less than the lawmakers <coughs> think that it does, partly because he himself morally demands the punishment. Isn't that interesting? We assume that, that uh, lawbreakers don't want to be punished, and uh, 
and hopefully the threat of the punishment will keep them from, from committing the crime. But if they commit the crime anyway, they're going to try to keep from getting caught. Well, what Dostoevsky says is that a part of the lawbreaker really wants to suffer the penalty because he knows he deserves it. His conscience testifies to that. But another part of it, well, a part of him wants to escape the penalty, excuse me, but another part of him wants to be caught because he knows he deserves it. He may commit his crimes, in fact, he may even commit his, begin to commit his crimes carelessly just so that he will be caught. Uh, or he may commit new crimes because for the old crimes he didn't get caught, he didn't get punished. He hasn't yet been punished for the old crimes, so he has to commit new ones so that maybe he'll be punished. That was Dostoevsky's theory, and you know, I think, he's, I think that that explains a lot. In our own times, another obvious place to look for examples of false atonement is abortion. Abortion is the great moral crisis of our time, like slavery was <coughs> for uh, our 19th century ancestors. Here is a true story. A woman, uh, this was told to me by a crisis pregnancy counselor, a woman aborted her first child to punish her husband because he wanted the child. But during the pregnancy, she discovered that he had been unfaithful to her. So she punished him by having the abortion. Now later on, she, she aborted her second child too. Why? Why? Was it because she was still angry with her husband? No. What she explained to her counselor was that the reason that she had her second abortion was, I quote, I wanted to be able to hate myself more for what I did to the first baby. Do you see what's happening here? The first time she was punishing her husband, but the second time she was punishing herself. Don't get me wrong, she wasn't repenting. Even, though, even so, something in her drove her to pay a price in a perverse way because she repeated the wrong so that she'd feel even worse, so that she'd feel she'd pay the price of the remorse. Efforts to atone without repentance take other, other forms too. It was once expected, for example, that the release of the so-called abortion pill would generate a vast increase in the number of abortions because the theory ran that it is so much easier to swallow a pill than to undergo a surgical procedure. The facts turned out to be much different. The, uh, the abortion pill, what used to be called RU486, can cause severe bleeding, cramping, and nausea. The expulsion of the embryo may, may take several days. The woman may be able to recognize the remains of her child in the toilet or in the collection bucket. The dread of it all isn't that. The dread of it all is that for some women, these burdens are just what makes RU46 attractive. They welcome that suffering. They regard it as a price that they ought to pay. Pro-abortion researchers, and again, please note, my example is from an article by people who not, were not like me, pro-life. They were pro-abortion. They were psychologists who were writing the article. They, they wrote an article about a clinical trial of RU486, and they described one such case as follows. This is a quotation, a direct quotation. Pauli's experience, Pauli was a, a false name, of course, to protect the person. Pauli's experience with mifeprestone, misoprestol, that was the drug, dragged on for weeks. She bled heavily on and off. She eventually had to have an aspiration. She saw her prolonged experience as a sort of penance that she was paying for the act of abortion. The miscarriage, quote unquote, this young woman told herself that her abortion had been a miscarriage, uh, uh, did not go smoothly. So she couldn't maintain the fiction that what was happening to her was a miscarriage. Quote, I just felt like this was happening because of what I'd done she told the nurses. A physician who was the medical director at one of the locations that was conducting the trial of the drug made the same observation. Mind you, he was pro-abortion too. He said, there were a couple of cases of women who had a feeling that in some way they were sort of accepting their punishment for being pregnant because they would bleed more, they would have more pain. One of the nurses at this location amended his expression, a couple, to a lot. She said, for some women, I think it helped because it was a longer process. They were able to work through the guilt that they were feeling for terminating the pregnancy. A lot of that mea culpa stuff was like, I am guilty, I am suffering, I'm having more cramps, I'm having more bleeding, I'm having more time to suffer over my choice in choosing this miscarriage rather than having an abortion. 
a lot of women seemed to get real involved emotionally with that end <coughs> quote. Now that's very illuminating, but I think that we should challenge the nurse's statement. And some it helped, and some it didn't. She wasn't reasoning very deeply about this. And there was sarcasm in her remarks about what she called all that mea culpa stuff, and her calling it a, a, a miscarriage instead of an abortion, even though it was induced deliberately by the drug. Does false atonement really help anyone? No doubt it, som it sometimes does make uh, guilty feelings go away in the sense of making them fade a little bit. But guilty conscience is a different thing than, than guilty feelings. The knowledge is there even if the feelings aren't. And the problem with false atonement is that it doesn't actually pay. It doesn't actually pay the price. It doesn't actually atone. After all, you can't repent something in the very act of doing it. Suffering isn't a fee that makes the deed all right. So what is the result? The urge to atone comes screaming back with guilty feelings or without them. I wonder how many of the poor women in these clinical trials went on to find further punishments for themselves. And how many of the men who are standing invisibly in the background, let's not forget about them. I counseled a young man once who had uh, taken his girlfriend to have an abortion and uh, been complicit in it and encouraged it and, uh, and uh, come up with the money for it. And uh, he was suicidal afterward. He said, I killed my child. Let's not forget about them. I'm, not ta I'm talking about conscience in general, though. I'm not just talking about abortion. Abortion's my example, but I'm talking about conscience in general. I'm only using it to illustrate something about how conscience works. If you are pro-abortion, you may be thinking that I've got it all wrong, that the problem isn't false atonement, but just the belief that abortion is wrong. You may think, well, it isn't wrong. When you have an abortion, you haven't done anything wrong. Well, I don't think so. If it was just a false belief, then surely it would be a lot easier to deal with. These symptoms ought to be a lot easier to get rid of. There was a woman, Jonah Appleton. She was a former activist for the National Organization of Women, the feminist organization. And she was a former head nurse at a Virginia abortion facility. She reported that she used to ask herself, she used to ask herself why abortion, I'm quoting now, was such a psychological trauma for a woman and such a difficult decision for a woman to make if it was a natural thing to do. If it was so right, why was it so difficult? She thought, quote, quoting again, I counseled these women so well, they were so sure of their decision. Why are they coming back to me now, months and years later, psychological wrecks? Psychological wrecks. Many women who have had abortions report afterward. Sometimes it makes years for them to connect the dots and realize what's going on. They don't know why this is happening, but they find themselves clenching their fists when they see a mother with a child. They fall into inexplicable depression around the time that the child would have been born. And it may take years for them to realize the connection of the times. They break up their relationships. They might have had the abortion in order to save a relationship. They might have thought, my boyfriend will leave me. My husband will leave me. My parents will kick me out if I have this child. And yet then, to punish themselves, they break those relationships themselves. They fall into drug dependency. They do one thing after another in, in a, a bid to the Supreme Court to rehear the Roe versus Wade decision, a, a lawyer's organization that I cooperated with collected affidavits from women who had suffered those things. One after another, the stories were really tragic. So I understand what Joan Appleton meant. Why are they coming back to me now, months and years later, psychological wrecks? The revenge of conscience explains a remark of G.K. Chesterton. He once remarked, men may keep a sort of level of good but no man has ever been able to keep on one level of evil. That road goes down and down. And I think that's right. Pursued by the five furies, we become worse than we were, and the process spins out of control. In the long run, now I'm going to surprise you. 
I don't think that's necessarily bad that the process spins out of control. As the poet Dante wrote, for some of us, and by the way, I'm not being self-righteous here because although the history of my own self-deception doesn't concern us, some of us once included me, for some of us, the road that leads up goes down a long time first. Why must that be? Because for some of us at some times, for most of us at some times, and for some of us at most times, guilty knowledge just isn't exhortation enough. If you don't, if you refuse to heed conscience as a voice of warning, then you're going to have to suffer conscience and as an accuser. And if you won't listen to it even then and repent, then you're going to have to suffer it as a punisher. Drastic measures become necessary to try to get you to face the truth. Driving life out of filter is, so to speak, the last resort, the exhortation of last resort. We become worse than we were, but then we'd intended to become worse than we were, hadn't we? That's what obstinacy and denial are all about. You're trying to make yourself wicked and stupid. And your only hope is that maybe you'll become wickeder and stupider than you had intended so that it shocks you back to a recognition of the reality of your situation and you can come back to the truth. If, if we are that obstinate, there may come a point when our only hope is for that to happen. If all goes well, we may finally be so wretched that like the prodigal son, we come to ourselves, which really means coming to God. Because we're made in his image. To come back to ourselves, then, means to recognize that image again and to come to him. Apparently, for the chance to soften a heart, for the chance to soften a heart, the unfathomable, the unfathomable mercy of the creator of the heart is even willing that for a while that heart may be allowed to become more rock-like still. For those who think of God as a tooth fairy, these are staggering reflections. But I think it's simply how it is. Some of them certainly applied to me at an earlier stage in my life. I wonder, could any of them apply to you? Thank you. I know this has not been an easy talk to listen to. I thank those of you who have listened to it nonetheless. And I would be glad to respond to your questions. So we do have an opportunity for questions now. And actually, I'm noticing that there's a microphone over there, and I suspect that's uh, where I'm supposed to direct you to go. So if you have a question for Professor Bujaszewski, if you would, please uh, come on over here to this microphone, and, and you can pose your question now. Better check it. Flaming Lips, and the song's called the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah song. Yeah. And there's a quote that uh, says, if you could make everybody poor just so you could be rich, would you do it? And then the chorus goes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I'm curious as to, do you think greed is more powerful than conscience? Because how can hedge fund managers and people who work at Goldman Sachs uh, knowingly sell bonds that are going to fail to people? And they make a, a ton of money while other people are becoming poor. How do they sleep at night? And um, I don't think they feel guilty about it at all. Well, I, I, uh, I, I think that the question, that's an interesting question. Whether, whether greed is stronger than conscience depends on what, what you mean by stronger. For a given person at any particular time, the motive of greed might be stronger than the motive of conscience. Conscience is saying, don't do this. His greed is saying, do it. And he yields to the greed. All right? It may be stronger in that sense. But on the other hand, it's weaker than conscience in another sense, because he cannot do away with his conscience. He cannot destroy it. He can try to plug his ears to it. Shut up, shut up, shut up, you know. He can try to close his eyes to it. I don't, I don't see that. I won't look at it. I won't think about it. 
but it's going to come back at him, even if he's able to suppress his feelings of remorse or to not have feelings of remorse, and some people don't have feelings of remorse. What he can't, what he can't suppress is the guilty knowledge, and, and it is going to produce this symptomology, you know, false atonement, false confession, false, uh, false justification. Those things are going to happen. I think it's ineluctable, it's irresistible, it's inexorable. And in that sense, I, I think that conscience is stronger. Now, that doesn't guarantee that he's going to, he's going to uh, repent and come back. But, uh, but, it, but that is his hope. Thanks. Hi. Uh, going back to the abortion example, yeah, sure. do you think those women that felt so guilty after they had the abortion didn't feel guilty because of their conscience, but because society told them that what they did was wrong? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Society tells people all the time that it's just fine. You know, you, you hear in your, in, your, in, your, in your classes that it's fine. Your teachers tell you that it's fine. The newspaper tells you that it's fine. The legislature tells you that it's fine. The Supreme Court tells you that it's fine. Everybody's saying it's fine. You know, and that's what baffles so many of these pro-abortion counselors. They say, they say, we keep telling them that it's fine. They say, I think it's fine. They say, I'm okay with this. Why are they such a wreck afterward? But the vast majority of people I've met, not legislators or abortion counselors or anything, but average people, mm -hmm. are very strongly against it. Well, it, that's... I've seen a shift then. When I, I've been teaching since, uh, since 1981. And um, uh, I think that's partly because people are just like, just like there came a point in the, uh, in the history of slavery when, pe when many people began to recognize that there's a problem here. Uh, we're coming to a point when more people are beginning to recognize that there's a problem with abortion, even though it's still legal. The number of abortions, and the number of abortions is still very high. Um, it is going down. Uh, and there is a shift. When I, in, in the 1980s, if I used to say things like I've said here, people would scream at me. Once in, in class, uh, this is a true story, I, I, was, um, I was trying to explain something. It wasn't even about the founders. It was about the American founding. Uh, the founders held a certain theory of human motivation that, um, that people either acted because of self-interest or because of passion or because of virtue. And they thought that a sound constitutional arrangement for a country, for a republic, was going to have to figure out how to steer self-interest, hold back passion by delaying decision, and, um, and uh, make the most of what little bit of virtue there is. So I was trying to explain this to my students, and I said, and I, and I, I got to the passion section, and I said, can you give me an example of a political issue that arouses passion? Well, it was an eight o'clock class. My students were pretty dull, you know, that day. They, you know, they all kind of just looked at me. <laughs> you know, I guess they were thinking about wishing that they'd had another cup of coffee before they came to class. And uh, I don't usually like to do this, but, um, but it, they, that they were just so sluggish that day that I said, they said, shall I give you an example? They all went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, how about right now? The Congress is debating partial birth abortion. They all looked at me like they still didn't know what I was talking about. I said. Did you, didn't you know that the Congress is debating that right now? A prohibition on partial birth abortion. They, they said, no, we didn't know that. I said, well, do you know what partial birth abortion is? They said, no. So I said, I told them what partial birth abortion is. I gave a one sentence clinical description with no evaluative language. I just, gave, I just described what the procedure was. A woman at the side of the, of the class, an older student, uh, about, you know, I would say about 30, maybe 35, just started screaming at me at the top of her lungs. Screaming, it took a while before I even realized that there were words in the scream, that it was articulate. She was telling me that it was only done to save the life of the mother, and she was just infuriated with me. And uh, I said, well, as a matter of fact, there was one person who testified to the Congress that that was the only time it's done, but he admitted afterward, he was a, an abortionist, and he admitted afterward that he perjured himself, that it wasn't true. And she started screaming again. I, I turned to the class and I said, now do you see why the framers were concerned about passion and politics? And she, she stopped screaming like, like a switch. Now this kind of thing used to happen. But now today, on the other hand, I, I, I comment on these things in my class and people don't scream. There are different hot button issues that hit them and make them mad. So what you're describing, I think, may have to do with local culture. It may have to do with this shift in opinion. But, uh, but believe me, out where I am, you know, out where I am, 
the what the what the what the public culture says is that in uh, in liberal Austin is that is that abortion is just fine. People are not strongly against it. My city council pays for it. I just would like to say first, uh, thank you for coming out into the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it is uh, in the middle of nowhere. It's beautiful here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although it does get kind of lonely. Um, <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, my uh, main concern with your your speech was that uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your speech that anthropologists would have a uh, biased opinion towards their research, and in my opinion. Um, you may have also had biased opinion towards your research. And the reason is that you didn't mention any of the societies that actually uh, allowed a type of murder to take place, but it was socially acceptable, such as the Aztecs and sacrifices. They sacrificed uh, people to their gods. Sure. And uh, this, well, this actually, was socially acceptable. Yeah. Well, actually, I did. I did mention several societies. The two most conspicuous societies that I mentioned where certain forms of murder had been considered acceptable were, first of all, Nazi Germany. And I explained what, that the evidence was that even though they were trying to convince themselves it was morally acceptable, it wasn't working. All right? And the other example that I gave was us with the case of abortion. You know, we've now aborted 50 million people. One third of your generation is dead. That's way more than the, than the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, I think those are two pretty conspicuous examples. The Aztecs, I'm sure that the phenomenon of the revenge of conscience was working on them too. This is one of the reasons why things get worse. Look, if you tell yourself, take abortion for instance. Back in the 1970s, many of the people who opposed the legalization of abortion before the Supreme Court decision used to say, you know, <laughs> you legalize abortion today, the next thing you're going to do, you're going to be legalizing uh, infanticide. You're going to be saying that's good too. People said, oh, no, no, no. Don't give me these slippery slope arguments. That's not going to happen. This is entirely different. Now, what in fact did happen? This is an I talked about false atonement, but one of the what I'm now going to tell you is part of part of uh, part of how false justification works. You you did you you deliberately took innocent human life. You're not repenting, and so you've got to somehow justify it to yourself. So you try to con you have to try to convince yourself either this wasn't human, and people would say this was just a blood clot or it was just some, you know, some tissue that I was getting rid of or something like that. Uh, or you would say to yourself, it, you know, it isn't, um, it isn't alive. Or you would say to yourself that it isn't innocent. There is a, there is a feminist lawyer who has written a book explaining that um, she thinks that the reason why abortion is okay is that the, the unborn child is not innocent. It's an aggressor against the woman. It's an intruder in her womb. It makes her pregnant against her will. And she is therefore justified in using lethal force to stop it, just like, just like if somebody was, uh, was raping her. That's her argument. The child is not innocent. We tell ourselves these things. One of the most conspicuous ways that we do this is we try to persuade ourselves that the child is not a human person. One of the ways that this is done, for, uh, for example, is that we'll redefine humanity. Instead of, you know, we, 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 I mean, it looks like, obviously, this is a human person. This is not a dog growing there in the uterus. This is not a tortoise. This is not a monkey. This is, this is a human individual. The DNA of this child is different than, is unique. It's different than that of the mother or the father. Uh, but we'll say, well, this isn't a human person because we'll define personhood in terms of, say, consciousness, ability to make complex plans, to carry out complex plans, uh, to feel pain, and so forth. Well, if that's the criterion of personhood, then an infant isn't a person yet either, because the infant can't carry out, carry out complex, complex plans. Uh, and in fact, by the logic of it then, willy-nilly, against your will, in order to hang tough and justify abortion, you're driven to embrace a set of premises about what it is to be a person that have the consequence of justifying infanticide too, and that is what is happening. Look in the medical ethics journals. Okay, it, infant, I just just last just last month there was a controversy because of a new article appearing in one of the online medical ethics journals justifying infanticide. I, I think that I think that in these ways, the reason that we em, the embrace of one evil drives us further into more evils, and that's not because we don't have conscience but because we do have conscience and it's taking its revenge. Because we have an urge, a drive to justify ourselves, and if we refuse to repent, 
then we're going to have to uh, engage in these strategies of convincing ourselves that drive us further out of kilter. That's what happens in those societies. We could, uh, we could name other societies, though. what about cannibals? They say, well, they don't know that it's wrong to deliberately take innocent human life. Look, they eat, their, they eat the people in the other tribe. Yeah, what do they say, though? What they say is, well, those guys in the other tribe aren't human. And yet, what do we see? Before they go on the raid against the other tribe, they engage in elaborate expiatory rituals, you know, to expiate guilt. Why would you engage in a, in a ritual to expiate guilt if at some deep level um, uh, you didn't know that your own claim that these guys in the other tribe aren't human is a lie? Yeah, I, I think that these things are going on in ourselves and that a lot of things that we, that we take as, we take the fact that people do these things as proof that they don't have a conscience uh, if you look more closely, what you see is piling up evidence that they do have a conscience and it's, it's wreaking revenge on us. That would be my answer to you, sir. Um, well, when I, uh, I want to finish what I was saying. Oh, okay, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Uh, I have patience. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't want my girlfriend or wife to have an abortion mm -hmm. um, herself because I kind of want kids one day. Uh, the rest of the world might not want me to have kids, but that's besides the point. Um, but anyway, uh, so the, what I'm trying to explain is that uh, there are certain conditions within society mm -hmm. that are placed in society where people feel morally guilty, but it's not really uh, universally felt. For example, I myself am a skeptic. I, am, I make no qualms about like, me being an atheist. Everyone knows that. Um, and I make it a point for everyone to know that. And, uh, and I've talked with other people who are Christian and they think that uh, they feel really guilty if they, for instance, commit blasphemy or heresy or even have sex outside of marriage. However, as an atheist, a skeptic, I don't feel guilty on those regards. And so you're concentrating more so on the universal guilt factors of uh, murder and stealing okay. rather okay. than individual. Sir, sir, let me ask you a question. Do you have a conscience? Of course. Okay, thank you. I agree with you. Do you think that it is wrong to deliberately take innocent human life? Of course. Um, good. I claim, I have claimed, that you do know that. I have claimed that you can't not know that. It seems to me you're on my side. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, murder is a universal guilt factor where, um, of course murder's going to be bad. Of course everyone's going to feel guilty for that. But people, That's my feel, point. people feel guilty for, uh, for things like... Um, uh, oh, okay. If what you want to say is that things feel, people feel guilty sometimes for things that aren't wrong, sure, that, yeah. there is such a thing as neurotic guilt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't take the fact that somebody feels guilty as proof that what they did is wrong. What I'm saying is that if you have done wrong, and the wrong that you did concerns one of the big ticket items where I say you can't not know the moral truth here, you will not necessarily feel guilty, but you will have guilty knowledge, and it will have consequences for your personality and the rest of your life. That's what that's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. I was All right. Maybe All right. Thank you. Trying to do Thank you. Thing. Yes, sir. Actually, sort of uh, building on what he asked, a friend of mine uh, and I were both Christians, uh -huh. and she is far more just in her theological viewpoints and uh, similar things. She's far more legalistic than I am. Okay. Um, and I have... Is she, is she here? She's not. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering how she felt about that. <laughs> okay, I was just curious. Go ahead. <laughs> well, um, my question is, I've seen her showing the, um, the symptoms of being pursued by the Furies, as you put it. Uh, she's shown those sorts of things after committing various actions that um, many many people, even Christians, wouldn't believe are wrong. How, or is there any way, any easy way to know what is true guilty knowledge and what is, as you put it, neurotic guilt? How can you tell the difference? Okay, just from looking at the behavior of the guilty person, you can't tell. I wouldn't say, look at how feel, people who feel guilty behave and then you can know if it's wrong. I'm going in the other direction. What I'm saying is, well, there are some things that are wrong, some universal moral basics. The Ten Commandments sorts of things, right? Don't kill, don't steal, honor your parents. 
we, we all really do know these things are wrong. And we will, in fact, have guilty knowledge when we violate them. And that has consequences. If you start at the other end and, and look at the, at the, at the behavior uh, where people are acting guilty and try to reason just from that behavior to whether what they did was wrong, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can do it. I think that, I think that in order to sort that out, you have to do basic moral philosophy. You have to, this is part, what part of the natural law is. You have to just reason out, is this wrong? You know? And I would, I would start at that end. If you wanted to discuss these things with your girlfriend, for instance, I wouldn't talk about her symptoms with her. I would, I would talk about the issues and discuss, is such and such a thing wrong? Is such and such a thing wrong? Why? Thank you. Sure. One of your responses to a question combined with what you've said throughout your talk, yes. it makes me feel that most of your research and experience is on the area of abortion. And as you said, that was a hot button issue in the 70s and 80s. And you also said in answer to one of the questions that there's different hot button issues now. And I was wondering if you'd take a minute to elaborate on what you think the hot button issues right now are in this regard. Um, the, some of the hot button issues have to do with certain sexual practices. I think uh, they're they're getting to be they're getting to be more difficult. It's a funny thing. I see two things happening. On the one hand, I see, uh, and I, I just I just published a book called The Meaning of Sex. On the one hand, I I, I see that the among the my students, for example, uh, sexually speaking, their lives are more disordered than they were 20 years ago. But on the other hand, they are also much willing to acknowledge that there is something disordered about it all. You know, 20 years ago, when I would speak to, 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 to people, people would say, sexual revolution problems? What are you talking about? You know, everything's fine. Come on in. The water's good. <laughs> and uh, now people's, people's, people seem to acknowledge that there is, something, there is something disturbing about their own behavior. There's something, there's something, there's something disordered here. I, sp I, I once commented in one of my classes, since I teach ethics and political philosophy, and you know, even if you're reading a book like Plato, he discusses sexuality. These kinds of things will inevitably come up. And um, by way of almost a sort of an apology to my students once in class, I didn't want them to think that I was being self-righteous in, in taking these issues seriously. I said, you know, my generation invented the sexual revolution, but I think yours is paying the price. We shoved off a lot of the consequences of it onto you, and I'm sorry for that. You're, you're paying the price for what we did. One of my students spoke up, and he said, I know exactly what you mean. He said, I, I want more than anything, I'd like to fall in love with a girl and marry her and be faithful to her and love her for the rest of our lives. And, you know, my heart lifts. I think, wow, that's, that's good to hear. And he says, but I don't think it's possible because my parents couldn't make it work. And they broke up. And this discouragement about it, it is this, uh, the, the life is more, it wasn't that he didn't know that there was a problem here. Boy, he knew. But he thought he was trapped. He didn't think that it, you know, that this can be fixed. That there was, he knew that he was, that there, that there is a, 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 a malady, but he didn't think that there was a cure. That was really, that was very distressing. And uh, I see this kind of brokenness and unhappiness all the time. And yet, of course, the pop culture wants to say, <laughs> still, <laughs> you know, it's all about pleasure, and it's really cool, and it's fine. And I look around, and I see this. I see a landscape of unutterable sweetness. Sex, you know, is a good thing. It was created by God. Despoiled by, un by, by inexpressible pain because we try to experience that sweetness in ways that, that don't work. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, I guess I just wondered, uh, you've talked about some of this, but what role the uh, media plays in all this, especially? Um, is this the one? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like you had talked about a little bit, but of supposedly maybe massaging our conscience a certain way and telling us what... Uh, is acceptable, sometimes a minority even, saying, you know, drug use, sex, 
etc. They're telling us it is acceptable now and your conscience shouldn't have a problem with it, that kind of thing. And then obviously, too, the person, if you go and live in that kind of lifestyle, I mean, I used to be a drug addict and stuff, too. And I mean, just when you get blunted and dull and how it's easier to make bad decisions, but your conscience is still there. And so those two things where yeah. you yeah. can be told things and try and live that way, but then the whole, like, you know, despair and that downward, you said. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, that you mentioned that, by the way. You know, once when I was talking about, this is off the subject, I'm not answering your question yet, but uh, once there was, I was on the radio trying to explain this idea of the revenge of conscience, uh, and I was, talking about, um, I was talking about how sometimes the very accusations of our conscience, instead of keeping us from doing wrong things, they lead us further into it, right? And a guy phoned up, it was a call-in show, and he said, I know exactly what you mean. He said, I'm a drunk. Uh, he said, I'm an alcoholic, I'm on the wagon, I'm not drinking now. But he said, when I was drinking, I would feel really guilty for drinking. And so, I would drink. You know, just try to, to, try to drop it, and that, that, that actually is a good example. So thank you very much for your honesty about this. Um, well, as to the media, sure. Uh, it, you know, you've got all of these images, the, the beer commercials and all of that kind of thing. And this is just, this is just one happy party, right? There are no consequences, uh, and in fact, it doesn't work that way. Philosophers talk about something that's sometimes called the hedonistic paradox. The paradox is, if you make pleasure your goal in life, the funny thing is, you end up without any pleasure. The only way that people can experience pleasure is as a byproduct of not seeking pleasure per se, but doing things that are good in themselves. You know, loving and... Uh, and, uh, and having children and uh, trying to learn something and trying to achieve something and be useful to, 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 to other people. And then we, 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 we surprisingly <laughs> have pleasure. Uh, but that's not, what would be, that's not the image that the pop culture presents to us, is it? Somebody was talking about some of the music a little while ago. That's not the image that we get from our music. You know, there's a different image of how to make yourself happy and then, the, and then these guys fry their brains and kill themselves. Uh, it's, uh, the funny thing is, when you try to s speak to people often about what is necessary to really be happy, people think that it's a joy-killing message that you're hearing. Okay? They, <laughs> as though what you want is for them to, to not have any fun. But, but uh, I think it's, it's the message of joy itself that I want to get across, that, that we weren't made for pain. We were, you know, and if, and, and you know, you, you, you go after the wrong thing, and by golly, you're gonna get that pain anyway. Uh, you know, there are other connections with the media. Uh, people wanna make money, and so uh, shock factor plays into that. You won't, you won't think what is true, but what, what gets people atten with people's attention. You will be deliberately, one of the hot phrases, one of the catchphrases now is, uh, the cool words is transgressive. You'll show images of things that even shock the consciences of the people watching it, because it snags their interest. But of course, then, the, then they get jaded to that. And so you need to shock them even more. Like, uh, well, like, uh, like one of our uh, pop singers uh, on, the, on the cover, of, you know, the, 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 one of the themes in his, in his, uh, in his rap album was, uh, you know, he's got a dead woman in the trunk of his car, and he, you know, he talks about incest with his mother, and this and that, and the other sort of thing. And people say, yes, he's, I read a musical review once, and the reviewer said, he's one of those adorable rascals. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there is a problem here. There is a problem, uh, and it may take a long time for people to come back to sanity uh, about what about what happened is really required. Yeah, thanks. Um, you have made a distinction early on in your speech between. Uh -huh. um, you know what you called shallow conscience, I forget the Greek word. Oh, surface conscience. Uh, Consci surface conscientia. And conscientia and synderesis, let's call them surface conscience and deep conscience. Okay. Um, and, and throughout your throughout your speech, you were focusing mainly on the deep conscience things, the things that are tied to you know, yes. human universals. But how much of what you were discussing also applies to the surface conscience, you know, the things that are mm -hmm. more informed by... Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Somebody a few minutes ago had asked, 
isn't it true that you can suffer some of the pathologies of a violated conscience, even when you didn't really do something wrong, but you think that it's wrong? And I, and I said yes. What, what's happening there is it, it, this is an operation that, that has to do with service conscience. Um, it's, it's a, you know, think of it this way. Because I believe that there is something in conscience that isn't just pumped in from the outside, people sometimes say, well, why do you need any moral teaching then? I like to say the, uh, the, uh, the, the permanent element in the, uh, in the human moral intellect is like the soil, and, the mor and it gives something that the moral teaching can take root in. But the moral teaching still has to be sound. Our, the moral judgments that we form on the basis of these first principles, these, these basics, uh, still have to be soundly reasoned and correct. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble. And uh, you're right about that. Uh, do you believe that Islamic extremists, extremists have a guilty conscience for uh, the killings that they do around the world, um, especially? Well, I, well, I notice that even uh, even for even people who uh, practice acts of terrorism. Uh, show evidence by the ways that they try to justify themselves that they do know the moral basics. For instance, after these, those, those, those uh, terrorists flew into the, into the Twin Towers, on Al Jazeera, there were people who insisted that this was okay. Now, why was it okay, did they say this? Because it's all right to deliberately take innocent human life? That's not what they said. What they said was, it's wrong to deliberately take innocent life but this was okay because Americans are guilty. Because their government has done rotten things in the world, this was the excuse, and since they have a democratic system, uh, the people are to blame for the government they have. And so these people whose lives were taken in the Twin Towers were not really innocent human life. This was an act of just punishment. Now I think that's excuse making. But, but like all excuses, it's making use it, in, a, in a wrong way. It is abusing a true moral principle that murder is. It was making use of the knowledge that murder is deliberately taking innocent human life. They had to try to find some way to try to convince themselves that, that these people weren't innocent. Yeah, so I think that they have a conscience. I think that they know, but, but they are uh, making excuses to themselves and not being honest about this. Uh, are there good rational arguments for why you shouldn't uh, are there good rational arguments for why you shouldn't kill and shouldn't steal uh, that don't require God or is conscience dependent entirely on God well it depends on what you mean by dependent entirely on God you remember one of the questioners a few minutes ago identified himself as an atheist and he said and I said do you have a conscience and he said, yes. And I said, I agree with you. I think you do, too. I don't think that you have to have, ex an ex an, um, ex have an explicit belief in God to have a conscience. It's basic human equipment. It's factory equipment. On the other hand, if you don't believe in God, I think you're going to find it very, very difficult for you to explain to yourself what your conscience is. Right? If you don't, be if you don't believe in a law, you know, you, I, I've, had, I've had people tell me, well, I, you know, I'm an atheist, but I believe in a moral law. Um, well, you might have, on your premises, if, you, if there isn't a lawgiver, how can there be a law, right? Or somebody might say, well, I'm a materialist. I think matter is all there is. But I believe in a moral law. Well, now, wait a minute. If you're a materialist, then it should be that the only, the only things that exist are, are matter, or the properties of matter, or the activities of matter, right? And, uh, and good and evil and right and wrong are not properties of matter. So you may indeed have some moral knowledge, but your philosophy can't explain to you what that moral knowledge is. You're in trouble. It can. What? Society can be the lawgiver. Well, I don't think society can be the... Can society function without with people well, okay. killing innocents and stealing? Why should... Why should killing innocents or stealing be necessary for the for the ongoing of society? No, it's society cannot function if those things go on. Oh, right. Okay, yes, sure. But do you notice that you only pushed the moral premise one step further back? You're saying, well, this isn't about conscience. I, I'm. It's it's not because I say it's intrinsically wrong that we're against killing. It's just that it society can't function 
if we kill. Well, okay, sure, fine, let's say that. But then one, 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 what one has to ask is, um, why should, should society function? You've still got the moral premise that it ought to function, that you ought to be promoting the common good. That's a moral premise. You know, you're still starting from a, from a first principle here that is, that is ethical. You know, people will say, this isn't about morality, it's just about survival, or this isn't about morality, it's just about adaptation. Well, they're still assuming that survival or adaptation is something good. That's a moral judgment, right? Okay, thanks. I've actually got something uh, prepared right here. I don't like to ask things just completely unprepared. So what I'd like to say here is I feel like you're overcomplicating morality, trying to point out different absolute truths or moral concepts based on whether one feels uh, guilty knowledge or guilty feelings. Well, no, no, not, not feelings. I, 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 I spent at least five minutes trying to explain the difference between the guilty, guilty knowledge feelings. Being there. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So based on whether there's guilty knowledge after such a possibly immoral action. But can't we simplify this a lot further? The question of an action being immoral or not, shouldn't that be based on just whether or not it causes suffering of other humans? I feel like bringing it down to that level simplifies a lot of this. We don't have to ask each okay. individual concept. Um, okay. Instead of needing a God or society to give us our morals, can't we just ask, is that action causing suffering? Because I feel like suffering is something that is universally identifiable. Okay, In the first, first of all, sir, you, you misunderstood me. I, I did not say the way we know what is right and wrong is that our consciences bother us. What I said was rather, if we do what we know to be wrong, we will have guilty knowledge and we will suffer the pathology of, of violated conscience. You know, you thought I was going from B to A, but I was going from A to B. Now, if what you want to say is that um, suffering is, that, that deliberately inflicting suffering is wrong, um, I would say that in, that in most cases that's true. On I'd the like other hand, the it's not actually. always true. When, when my children misbehaved and I sent them for a time out to their room, they suffered, okay? They were <laughs> frustrated and wanted to go outside and play. Uh, you know, or, or, or a child gets spanked or doesn't get dessert, that's suffering. If a criminal is put in prison, he's suffering, right? Um, but these, uh, these sufferings are, uh, are justifiable. And in fact, they're even justifiable in terms of the, of the longer range good of the, of, the, of the individuals themselves. So I don't think that you can reduce everything to suffering. Also, one of the, one of the other problems with the suffering ethic is that it's incomplete. Uh, most of the time, now I won't accuse you of this because I, I don't know you to think this and you didn't say it, but most of the time when I talk to people saying, it all comes down to avoiding suffering, everything, it's okay if it doesn't hurt anybody and, it, and it's bad if it does hurt somebody, very often people, uh, people have a very restrictive view of what counts as hurt. They think it's only physical hurt, right? What about, uh, there are all kinds of hurt that we can do to each other that aren't, uh, you know, that aren't physical. So I think that um, I don't, in the way that you thought that I was simple, thought that I was complicating things, I, I think the situation is complicated. There is more than one moral principle out there. Not every moral judgment can be reduced to, um, to uh, the avoidance of suffering. That example that you brought up, um, putting someone in prison causing justified suffering, I'd actually thought of that, but no, I would agree that that is not a justified suffering. The fact that you're putting them in prison, they, they've made some mistake, they owe something to society. Instead of trying to put them in prison and cause more suffering on them to make them repay the, some penance to society, isn't it a smarter move, a more just, a more moral move to instead rehabilitate that person, teach why the lesson's wrong, allow them to go back to society as somebody who's not going to cause such okay. a crime? You, do you notice that you've just introduced two, new, two more moral principles in addition to the one that you said was the only one that we needed. At first you were saying the only moral principle we need is to avoid causing suffering to others. But now you've, now you've added the moral principle that when people have done wrong, they owe something uh, to society. And also the moral principle that when people are in a bad condition, we owe them the effort to rehabilitate them, out of, which I guess is a principle of charity, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of love, of concern for them. And I think those are those are those are those are those are some pretty good moral principles. But it goes over and above the original one that you stated. So it looks to me like 
you're really on my side, that there's more to morality than just the one principle of avoiding suffering. Both those new moral topics that you just brought up, though, well, that you say I brought up, can't those both be reduced to are you causing suffering or not? I thought that you were bringing them up in order to suggest that, that, that okay, you agreed with me by appeal to these moral principles, you agreed with me that the infliction of this suffering was justifiable and good, um, and so that seems to that that doesn't seem that seems very different from saying everything is reducible to avoidance of suffering. We can talk about this some more, okay? But uh, you know, afterward, if you want to, I suspect that there might be some talking past each other and some misunderstanding. But we Possibly. can find that. Out. We can find that. Out. Yeah, I think those can both be brought back to. All right. It caused suffering as immoral. Okay. Hi again. Hi. Um, I. Um, I am actually studying biology, and okay. uh, and I make it no illusion to to point out that nature and natural selection and evolution and uh, the kill or be killed, eat or be eaten nature of nature, uh -huh. is actually uh, very cruel. Uh, for for example, um, Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite found in uh, rats and cats. And uh, the parasite actually controls the minds of rats in order to get fed off of cats because it makes them attract cat uh, urine. And um, then it completes its life cycle by being able to mate inside of the intestines of cats. Sure, Par parasitic, the, the, the pathology of parasitism is, is uh, very disturbing. Okay. Exactly. But go ahead, um, and the point that you want to make from so that is. So what, what I was uh, wondering is, uh, because this, this type of behavior is also found in like sand sharks where the, the um, uh, the baby sand sharks, while they're still in the womb, try to eat the other sand sharks. Oh, sure, and they're That's parasitic right. wasps that lay eggs in, in other insects. And exactly. Yeah, there are, we, we can lengthen the list of, of, of gross and uh, disturbing things in, in, uh, in, uh, in natural biology. But, but, you're question, coming, but you want to make a point about yes, this. Yes, yes. My question ahead. is, do you think that morality exists in animals other than humans? No, I, I don't think that... I don't think that a shark has a conscience, or, or that a, that a uh, that a, uh, that a that a rat has a sense of has a, has an understanding of right and wrong. Um, we are rational beings; we're able to make those judgments. The uh, the animal is acting on the basis of his of his impulses. He's not he's not reasoning. He's not engaging really in in, uh, in our sense in moral deliberation. Um, uh, do you think that uh, do you think you wouldn't say that a shark does have a conscience, would you? I mean, I suspect we agree about this. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. But um, but what the point I'm trying to get at is that there are some animals um, like sharks. Uh, it might surprise some people that most sharks don't actually hunt humans. They they eat uh, like they take a bite of human and then they realize, oh wait, this is not a fish. I'm backing out here. Doesn't taste good enough, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. It's, it doesn't sure. taste right, so they swim away. Most sharks. Yeah, some I'm glad about like that. that. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, the point that I'm trying to get at is that this type of behavior isn't found within all animals, such as dolphins. There uh, there has been numerous reports of um, of surfers getting attacked by sharks. And uh, dolphins will swim to the rescue, bite off the shark, swim around the, uh, okay. the yes. uh, surfer. And Sir, what is your question? <laughs> Don't dolphins have morals because they're saving oh. a natural human? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, my cat, uh, uh, one of my cats once had kittens, and she nursed her kittens. Did she nurse her kittens because she had what, what in human terms we call love? Well, you know, not really. When the other when the other kittens would, would, would push the runt out of the way because they were greedy, she didn't make sure that the runt uh, got enough to eat. She just she she just it was an impulse of cat nature that uh, that uh, that caused her to lie down when her mammary glands were stimulated in certain ways, and they could get at the mammary glands. Um, I don't know what the reasons for dolphin behavior are. I do know that a number of different hypotheses have been, have been offered. Uh, some people have even suggested that this was play behavior on the part of the dolphins. And they, you know. But suppose it somewhere to de someone were to demonstrate, this is an empirical question, suppose that someone were to offer evidence that dolphins were not just animals, as we thought for centuries, but that they were rational beings like us, capable of moral deliberation, 
and that they were, in these instances where they seem to be saving swimmers from sharks, they were acting out of a genuine concern for the human, you know, like when I, when, like when I push somebody out of the way of the onrushing truck uh, at some cost to myself. Well, then I would say, well, I'm glad to find another, uh, another intelligent species on the planet. Uh, I learned something here. I didn't know that before. That's really, that's really terrific. Uh, uh, how wonderful. You know, it would just be just like if we found another intelligent race on Mars, except this would be on this planet. There's nothing about natural law theory that says dogmatically that there couldn't be any other, any other rational creatures besides ourselves. And I don't claim to know which of all the possible creatures in the universe uh, are, are rational. Thank you. Thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.